Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One by Henry Charles Lee. Book One, Chapter Two: The Jews and the Moors, Part One. The influences under which human character can be modified, for good or for evil, are abundantly illustrated in the conversion of the Spaniards from the most tolerant to the most intolerant nation in Europe. Apologists may seek to attribute the hatred felt for Jews and Moors and heretics in the Spain of the fifteenth and succeeding centuries to an inborn peculiarity of the race, a cosa de España, which must be accepted as a fact and requires no explanation. But such facts have their explanation, and it is the business of the expositor of history to trace them to their causes. The vicissitudes endured by the Jewish race, from the period when Christianity became dominant, may well be a subject of pride to the Hebrew and of shame to the Christian. The annals of mankind afford no more brilliant instance of steadfastness under adversity, of unconquerable strength through centuries of hopeless oppression, of inexhaustible elasticity in recuperating from apparent destruction, and of conscientious adherence to a faith whose only portion in this life was contempt and suffering. Nor does the long record of human perversity present a more damning illustration of the facility with which the evil passions of man can justify themselves with the pretext of duty than the manner in which the church, assuming to represent him who died to redeem mankind, deliberately planted the seeds of intolerance and persecution, and deciduously cultivated the harvest for nearly fifteen hundred years. It was in vain that Jesus on the cross had said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was in vain that St. Peter was recorded as urging, in excuse for the crucifixion, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. The church taught that, short of murder, no punishment, no suffering, no obloquy was too severe for the descendants of those who had refused to recognize the Messiah, and had treated him as a rebel against human and divine authority. Under the canon law, the Jew was a being who had scarce the right to existence, and could only enjoy it under conditions of virtual slavery. As recently as 1581, Gregory the Thirteenth declared that the guilt of the race in rejecting and crucifying Christ only grows deeper with successive generations, entailing on its members perpetual servitude, and this authoritative assertion was embodied in an appendix to the corpus juris. When Paramo, about the same period, sought to justify the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, he had no difficulty in citing canons to prove that Ferdinand and Isabella could righteously have seized all their property and have sold their bodies into slavery. Man is ready enough to oppress and despoil his fellows, and, when taught by his religious guides that justice and humanity are a sin against God, spoilation and oppression become the easiest of duties. It is not too much to say that for the infinite wrongs committed on the Jews during the Middle Ages, and for the prejudices that are even yet rife in many quarters, the Church is mainly if not wholly responsible. It is true that occasionally she lifted her voice in mild remonstrance when some massacre occurred more atrocious than usual, but these massacres were the direct outcome of the hatred and contempt which she so jealously inculcated, and she never took steps by punishment to prevent their repetition. Alonso de Espina merely repeats the currently received orthodox ethics of the subject when he tells us that to oppress the Jew is true kindness and piety for when he finds that his impiety brings suffering, he will be led to the fear of God, and that he who makes another do right is greater in the sight of God than he who does right himself. In view of Spanish abhorrence to Jews and Saracens during the last five or six centuries, it is a fact worthy of note that the Spanish nations of the medieval period were the last to yield to this impulsion of the church. The explanation of this lies partly in the relations between the several races in the peninsula, and partly in the independent attitude which Spain maintained towards the Holy See, 
and its indisposition to submit to the dictation of the church to appreciate fully the transformation which culminated in the establishment of the inquisition and to understand the causes leading to it it will require a brief review of the position occupied by the jew and the saracen towards the church and the state in the primitive church there would seem to have been a feeling of equality if not of cordiality between christian and jew when it was deemed necessary in the apostolic canons to forbid bishops and priests and deacons as well as laymen from fasting or celebrating feasts with jews or partaking of their unleavened bread or giving oil to their synagogues or lighting their lamps this argues that kindly intercourse between them was only to be restricted in so far as it might lead to religious fellowship this kindly intercourse continued but as the church became mostly gentile in its membership the prejudices existing between the jew in the gentile world gathered strength until there becomes manifest a tendency to treat him as an outcast early in the fourth century the council of alvira held under the lead of the uncompromising hosius of cordova forbade marriage between christians and jews because there could be no society common to the faithful and the infidel no farmer was to have his harvest blessed by a jew nor was any one even to eat with him st augustine was not quite so rigid for while he held it lawful to dissolve marriage between the christian and the infidel he argued that it was inexpedient st ambrose was one of the earliest to teach proscription when he reproved theodosius the great for the favor shown by him to jews who slew christ and who deny god in denying his son and st john chrysostom improved on this by publicly preaching that christians should hold no intercourse with jews whose souls were the habitations of demons and whose synagogues were their playgrounds the antagonism thus stimulated found its natural expression in 415 in the turbulent city of alexandria where quarrels arose resulting in the shedding of christian blood when saint cyril took advantage of the excitement by leading a mob to the synagogues of which he took possession and then abandoned the property of the jews to pillage and expelled them from the city which they inhabited since its foundation by alexander that under such impulsion these excesses were common is shown by the frequent repetition of imperial edicts forbidding the maltreatment of jews and the spoiling and burning of their synagogues they were not allowed to erect new ones but were to be maintained in possession of those existing at the same time the commencement of legal disabilities is manifested in the reiterated prohibitions of the holding of christian slaves by jews while confiscation and perpetual exile or death were threatened against jews who should convert or circumcise christians or marry christian wives the church held it to be a burning disgrace that a jew should occupy a position of authority over christians in four thirty eight it procured from theodosius the second the enactment of this as a fixed principle and we shall see how earnestly it labored to render this a part of the public law of christendom this spirit received a check from the arianism of the gothic conquerors of the western empire theodoric ordered the privileges of the jews to be strictly preserved among which was the important one that all quarrels between themselves should be settled by their own judges and he sternly repressed all persecution when a mob in rome burned a synagogue he commanded the punishment of the perpetrators in terms of severe displeasure when attempts were made to invade the right of the jews of genoa he intervened effectually and when in milan the clergy endeavored to obtain possession of the synagogue he peremptorily forbade it so long as the wisigoths remained arian this spirit prevailed throughout their extensive dominions although the orthodox were allowed to indulge their growing uncharitableness when the council of agde in 506 forbade the faithful to banquet or even to eat with jews it shows that social intercourse still existed but that it was condemned by those who ruled the church in the east the same tendency had freer opportunity of expressing itself in legislation as when in 706 the council of constantinople forbade christians to live with jews or to bathe with them to eat their unleavened bread to consult them as physicians or to take their medicines gregory the great was too large-minded to approve of this growing spirit of intolerance 
and when some zealots in Naples attempted to prevent the Jews from celebrating their feasts, he intervened with a peremptory prohibition of such interference, arguing that it would not conduce to their conversion, and that they should be led by kindness and not by force to embrace the faith, all of which was embodied in the canon law to become conspicuous through its non-observance. In fact, his repeated enunciation of the precept shows how little it was regarded even in his own time. When, moreover, large numbers of Jews were compelled to submit to baptism in southern Gaul, he wrote reprovingly to the bishops Virgil of Arles and Theodore of Marseilles, but this did not prevent St. Avitus of Clermont about the same time from baptizing about five hundred, who thus saved their lives from the fanatic fury of the populace. These forced conversions in Gothia were the first fruits of the change of religion of the Wisigoths from Arianism to Catholicism. The Ostrogoths, Theodoric and Theodatus, had expressly declared that they could not interfere with the religion of their subjects, for no one can be forced unwillingly to believe. The Wisigoths, who dominated southern Gaul and Spain, when adapting the Roman law to suit their needs, had contented themselves with punishing by confiscation the Christian who turned Jew, with liberating Christian slaves held by Jews, and with inflicting the death penalty on Jewish masters who should force Christian slaves to conversion, besides preserving the law of Theodosius II, prohibiting Jews from holding office or building new synagogues. This was by no means full toleration, but it was merciful in comparison with what followed the conversion of the Goths to Catholicism. The change commenced promptly, though it did not at once reach its full severity. The Third Council of Toledo, held in May 589, to condemn the Arian heresy and to settle the details of the conversion, adopted canons which show how free had hitherto been the intercourse between the races. Jews were forbidden to have Christian wives or concubines or servants, and all children sprung from such unions were to be baptized. Any Christian slave circumcised or polluted with Jewish rites was to be set free. No Jew was to hold an office in which he could inflict punishment on a Christian, and this action was followed by some further disabilities decreed by the Council of Narbonne in December of the same year. That freedom of discussion continued for some time is manifested by the audacity of a Jew named Froganus, not long afterwards, who, as we are told, in the presence of all the nobles of the court, exalted the synagogue and depreciated the church. It was easier, perhaps, to close his mouth than to confute him, for Arasius, bishop of Toledo, excommunicated him and declared him anathematized by the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and by all the celestial hierarchy and cohorts. The greatest churchman of the day, St. Isidore of Seville, whose career of forty years commenced with the Catholic Revolution, did what in him lay to stimulate and justify persecution. His treatise against the Jews is not vituperative, as are so many later controversial writings, but he proves that they are condemned for their father's sins to dispersion and oppression, until, at the end of the world, their eyes are to be opened and they are to believe. That he should have felt called upon to compose such a work was an evil sign, and still more evil were the conclusions which he taught. They could not fail of deplorable results, as was seen when Sisabut ascended the throne in 612, and signalized the commencement of his reign by a forcible conversion of all the Jews of the kingdom. What means he adopted we are not told, but of course they were violent, which St. Isidore mildly reproves, seeing that conversion ought to be sincere, but which yet he holds to be strictly within the competence of the church. The church, in fact, was thus brought face to face with the question whether the forcible propagation of the faith is lawful. This is so repugnant to the teachings of Christ that it could scarce be accepted, but on the other hand, the sacrament of baptism is indelible, so the convenient doctrine was adopted and became the settled policy that, while Christianity was not to spread by force, unwilling converts were nevertheless Christians. They were not to be permitted to apostatize, and were subject to all the pains and penalties of heresy for any secret inclination to their own religion. This fruitful conception led to infinite misery, as we shall see hereafter, and was the impelling motive which created the Spanish Inquisition. 
Whatever may have been the extent and the success of Sisabut's measures, the Jews soon afterwards reappear, and they and the conversos became the subject of an unintermittent series of ecclesiastical and secular legislation, which shows that the policy so unfortunately adopted could only have attained its end by virtual extermination. The anvil bade fair to wear out the hammer. The constancy of the persecuted exhausted the ingenuity of the persecutor. With the conversion to Catholicism, ecclesiastics became dominant throughout the Wisigothic territories, and to their influence is attributable the varied series of measures which occupied the attention of the successive councils of Toledo from 633 until the Saracenic invasion in 711. Every expedient was tried, the seizure of all Jewish children to be shut up in monasteries or to be given to God-fearing Christians, the alternative of expulsion or conversion, to the enforcement of which all kings at their accession were to take a solemn oath, the gentle persuasives of shaving, scourging, confiscation, and exile. That the people at large did not share in the intolerance of their rulers is seen in the prohibitions of social intercourse, mixed marriages, and the holding of office. The specter of proselytism was evoked in justification of these measures as though the persecuted Jew would seek to incur its dangers, even had not the Talmud declared that, quote, a proselyte is as damaging to Israel as an ulcer to a healthy body, end quote. The enforced conversions thus obtained were regarded naturally with suspicion, and the converts were the subjects of perpetual animadversion. Thus the church had triumphed, and the toleration of the Aryan Goths had been converted into persecuting orthodoxy history repeats itself, and, eight hundred years later, we shall see the same process with the same results. Toleration was changed into persecution. Conversions obtained by force or by its equivalent irresistible pressure were recognized as fictitious, and the unfortunate converts were held guilty of the unpardonable crime of apostasy. Although the Goths did not invent the Inquisition, they came as near to it as the rudeness of the age and the looseness of their tottering political organization would permit, by endeavoring to create through the priesthood a network of supervision which should attain the same results. The Inquisition was prefigured and anticipated. As apparently the Jews could not be exterminated, or the conversos be trained into willing Christians, the two classes naturally added an element of discontent to the already unquiet and motley population consisting of superimposed layers of Goths, Romans, and Celtiberians. The Jews doubtless aided the Gallo-Roman rebellious of Flavius Paulus about 675, for St. Julian of Toledo, in describing its suppression by King Wamba, denounces Gaul in the bitterest terms, ending with the crowning reproach that it is a refuge for the blasphemy of the Jews, whom Wamba banished after his triumph. In spite of the unremitting efforts for their destruction, they still remained a source of danger to the state. At the Council of Toledo in 694, King Ahiza appealed to his prelates to devise some means by which Judaism should be wiped out, or all Jews be subjected to the sword of justice and their property be appropriated, for all efforts to convert them had proved futile, and there was danger that, in conjunction with their brethren in other lands, they would overthrow Christianity. In its response, the council alludes to a conspiracy by which the Jews had endeavored to occupy the throne and bring about the ruin of the land, and it decrees that all Jews, with their wives, children, and posterity, shall be reduced to perpetual servitude, while their property is declared confiscated to the king. They are to be transferred from their present abodes, and be given to such persons as the king may designate, who shall hold them as slaves so long as they persevere in their faith, taking from them their children as they reach the age of seven, and marrying them only to Christians. Such of their Christian slaves as the king may select shall receive a portion of the confiscated property, and continue to pay the taxes hitherto levied on the Jews." Doubtless this inhuman measure led to indiscriminate plunder and infinite misery, but its object was not accomplished. The Jews remained, and when came the catastrophe of the Saracen conquest, they were ready enough to welcome the Berber invaders. That they were still in Spain is attributed to Witiza, who reigned from 700 to 710, and who is said to have recalled them and favored them with privileges 
greater than those of the church, but Wittiza, though a favorite target for the abuse of later analysts, was an excellent prince, and the best contemporary authority says nothing of his favoring the Jews. If the Jews helped the Moslem, as we may readily believe, both from the probabilities of the case and the testimony of Spanish and Arab writers, they did no more than a large portion of the Christians. To the mass of the population, the Goths were merely barbarous masters, whose yoke they were ready to exchange for that of the Moors, nor were the Goths themselves united. If we are to believe an Arab chronicler, at the decisive battle of Zares, Don Roderick confided his right and left wings to kinsmen of Wittiza, who were secretly conspiring against him, and whose flight caused his defeat. The land was occupied by the Moors with little resistance, and on terms easy to the conquered. It is true that, where resistance was made, the higher classes were reduced to slavery, the lands were divided among the soldiery, and one-fifth was reserved to the state, on which peasants were settled, subject to an impost of one-third of the product, but submission was general under capitulations which secured to the inhabitants the possession of their property, subject to the impost of a third, and allowed them the enjoyment of their laws and religion under native counts and bishops. In spite of this liberality, vast numbers embraced Mohammedanism, partly to avoid taxation, and partly through conviction that the marvelous success of the Moslem cause was a proof of its righteousness. The hardy resolution of the few who preferred exile and independence, and who found refuge in the mountains of Galicia and Asturias, preserved the peninsula from total subjection to Islam. During the long struggle of the reconquest, the social and religious condition of Spain was strangely anomalous, presenting a mixture of races and faiths whose relations, however antagonistic they might be in principle, were, for the most part, dominated by temporal interests exclusively. Mutual attrition, so far from inflaming prejudices, led to mutual toleration, so that fanaticism became reduced to a minimum precisely in that corner of Christendom where a priori reasoners have been tempted to regard it as especially violent. End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 1